Geontologist. Yeah, Ger geriatrician. Ger yeah. Geriatrician. I'm so, sorry. yeah, thank you guys for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I've never been here, but it's beautiful out here. And I guess, was this a part, part of like a school, the campus? Yeah, it's beautiful out there. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about the brain today. It, and the presentation I was asked to give today was, it was supposed to be called the brain tour. So we're gonna tour our brain briefly and then talk about how, if we, how we can make our brains better, how, how we can optimize our brains. Um, so, you know, here it is. We're gonna, so our brain is one of the most complex organs that we have in our bodies. It is made up of billions of neurons, nerve cells, uh, which communicate via connections called synapses. And so each nerve ending kind of, you know, passes the information on from one nerve to the next and all the information comes from the outside up to the brain, integrates, and then it sends information out and we then act on that information. Uh, our brain is not simply all nerves though. It is also made up of lots of arteries and veins. So healthy blood comes into our brain and it is taken out by the veins and signals traveling through the brain form memories, thoughts, and feelings. And so here's a picture of how and what the blood supply to our brain looks like. So it is a huge network of arteries. As you can see, they're big arteries. So about 25% of the blood from our heart goes to the brain. So every time there's a heartbeat, 25% of the blood goes up to the brain and it is then distributed amongst all those arteries and veins that we see up there. Uh, so today we're gonna, you know, start our tour with the spinal cord. In front of the spinal cord in the picture, um, is this a pointer, Tammy? Yeah, I think it should, uh, that center. Oh, the center button? Nope. That's okay. Um, so we're gonna start here, if you will, the brain stem, which is this part. Um, and so this is our most primitive portion of our brain. And essentially that is the first area which forms when we have at conception. So then, you know, we see a heartbeat, you know, when you go to the gynecologist at four weeks or five weeks, to see if a woman is pregnant, they hear a heartbeat. And the heart so then is regulated by that primitive brainstem area. That area helps us do the basic functions such as breathing, sleeping, it regulates our body temperature, our heart activity. Uh, from that brainstem area, we're going to next go and travel to the cerebellum that's this area of our brain, which you know has lots of little grooves in there. Uh, essentially, lots of information. And the reason it is so layered is it's to provide it the amount of surface area it needs to hold all those neurons and all that information that we have uh, in our brain. And so what is the function of that? It helps us coordinate. It helps us with our muscle memory. It helps us with our balance. So, you know, if you knew how to ride a bike and you gave up at 20, 30, and you wanna restart at 50, it remembers. And so it's a cinch to go back to riding a bike. Swimming, if you gave it up and you wanna go back to it, that's the area of our brain that helps us remember how to swim again. Um, and then from that area, we're going to travel up to the basal ganglia up here. Uh, and so the basal ganglia is made up of lots of different other areas in our brain. All the networks um, kind of cross within the brain. And essentially the basal ganglia's job is to coordinate messages between all the areas. And it is involved in functions such as movement, learning, attention, habit formation, motivation, and emotions. And so, you know, 
it's a small area, but it's very important. All areas of our brain, every piece of our body is important. Uh, so as we continue our tour, we look at the big portion of the brain here, all the large grooves that we see in a brain. And those areas are then broken down into four areas. And out of its two hemispheres, and here's a brain, um, just to, um, if you wanna take a look, you can afterwards, but there's two sections to it. They do come apart in this brain, but and not in our brain, it's connected. Uh, but there are so two hemispheres and four different lobes. The frontal lobe, which is, as we see up here, that area, uh, is involved in planning, reasoning, problem solving, recognition, regulating emotions, and social skills. So when we look at you know social skills and behaviors, uh, in patients that have a little bit of memory impairment. That's the area that we're looking at. Um, again, and planning, reasoning, balancing our checkbooks. You know, when you go to the doctors, get evaluated for memory, they're making you draw a clock. They're making you, you know, connect A to one to B. Those are all the higher function areas that are basically part of what the frontal lobe does. And then we go into the temporal lobe, which is out here on the side. That helps us with our language, processing our auditory information. So everything that we hear, right, it's next to our ears. That's called the temporal lobe. And that's where our language and memory is as well, on the left side of our brain. So it, it's most of that memory is on the left side of the brain. And it helps us organize the information and it helps us with learning. And then we move on above it to the pink area, the parietal lobe, uh, which helps us recognize sensations, helps us with our body positioning, recognizing objects that we have seen in the past, spatial judgment and understanding time. So like the clock drawing. Um, occipital lobe, which is the most posterior lobe here, and the smallest one and the furthest one from our eyes is actually what helps us with our visual information. It helps integrate and process our visual information, color, shape, and distance. And so essentially that's the brain, and we're now going to add exit the brain and talk a little bit about, you know, what makes a patient or a person different than when we see changes that are associated with memory losses. What are some of the way, what are some of the ways, what are some of the risk factors that cause memory loss? Uh, so memory loss, it's usually multifactorial. There are patients that we see, you know, that have vascular large vascular strokes, but that's, it, most of the patients have multifactorial uh, risk factors. And so essentially it's genetics, head injury, if there was head injury, um, cardiovascular risk factors are very important. Diabetes type two is another very important risk factors that we constantly see. Um, and so what are some of the treatment options that we're going to talk about today? Lifestyle changes, you know, is essentially what we want to talk about today. What can we do holistically? Uh, what can we change in our daily lives that can help us be better and keep our brains as active as we can? So it's not a curable uh, disease, but we can slow it down. We can, you know, stabilize it. We can maybe reverse it by just a little bit, but it's not necessarily something that we can completely reverse. So how do we optimize and preserve brain function? Optimization of quality of life. We have to re rejuvenate ourselves and rejuvenate the brain. How do we rejuvenate? You know, does anybody have a way they want to rejuvenate? How do we rejuvenate our bodies? So, so sleep, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So that is one of, of it's a, a huge factor in how we feel the next day and how clearly we think, yeah. So physical exercises, um, huge, 
eating healthy, cognitive exercises, and we're gonna talk about each of these a little bit. Stress management, sleep hygiene, and there are a few more. If you're a smoker, you know, quitting smoking. If there's heavy drinkers, uh, alcohol drinking, um, time to cut that back. So there's that as well. And why should we optimize brain functions? You know, why do we see patients? You know, they come to us and say, well, I don't want to move into a nursing facility. I don't want to move into a facility, period. Everybody's happy in their homes and they don't want to leave, and, and which is great. That's what we're there for. We want to maintain that independence. We want to keep everybody where they are for as long as we can. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about optimizing our brain function. What is healthy nutrition and why is it important? It's important to keep our arteries healthy in the brain, reduce, and by keeping them healthy and eating healthy, we reduce inflammation and keep our brains healthy. Physical exercises, you know, what does that do? Why is it important? You know, it's not simply to, you know, look buff, but it's important because it allows our bodies to send oxygenated blood supply to the brain. Uh, socialization, you know, what we have at the senior centers, spending time with people you enjoy. We saw, you know, lots of depression and anxiety when the senior centers were closed during the pandemic the last few years. Uh, so, you know, cognitive, exercise, cognitive activities, what are they? Puzzles to challenge our brain, help it rewire. Every time we do a puzzle, every time we run into an uh, area within that puzzle where we have to think harder, your brain is actually working and coming up with new ways and wiring itself, making new neurons, and that helps rejuvenate your brain. So healthy nutrition, research is still evolving, but it is, you know, a most important part of this talk, food is medicine. What we fuel our body with, you know, fuels our brain and it fuels our brains. Brain and heart, sorry. Uh, following some dietary guidelines may reduce your risk for dementia, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. And so what, you know, so this is just like some data from a study that looked at other studies. It's like a meta-analysis, we call them. They, it's a, somebody sits down and kind of reviews all these little studies that were done. And what they found was that diets that are predominantly high in vegetables and legumes and fruits, nuts, nuts, not so much, but just a little bit of nuts, and we can talk about that here in a little bit. Whole grains, fish, less dairy, and less processed meats. And those diets uh, helped patients reduce their overall, re there was a reduction in overall death, reduction in death from heart attacks, cancer, Parkinson's disease, and Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, they are seeing good data that, that says that eating healthy matters. So here's an anti-inflammatory diet pyramid. And it could be a diet pyramid, it could be a plate, it can be anything you want it to be, but the point is that we want our diet to be high in vegetables and fruit. So half of it, you know, should be vegetables and fruit and a little bit of whole grain, a little bit of healthy fats and fish, meat, a little bit of that. And then we have the dark chocolate that Tammy was talking about way up top. Dark chocolate that 70% or more cocoa is what is healthy and has anti-inflammatory properties. Red wine, I'm not, I don't like to, tell my patients about that because my patients already have memory difficulties and alcohol can dampen our uh, thinking skills. And so, you know, the reason red wine is up there is because it has a molecule called the Cervatrol. That's the protective molecule that's in the wine that helps us with our immune system. and. So that's why the wine is important, but it also has alcohol. So if you're gonna take something, the supplement is called Reservatrol. We don't know, we don't have a lot of data on that, but that, 
that's something there are people taking it around the world uh, to improve their immunity and improve their defense mechanisms. So more on the diet, uh, anti-inflammatory diet, uh, basically aim for variety, fresh fruits as much as possible, minimize consumption of processed foods and fast foods, eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, aim for the rainbow spectrum. There's also what's called a rainbow diet. Essentially, it means include lots of fruits and vegetables. So, you know, there's Mediterranean diet, rainbow diet, anti-inflammatory diet, but I think in, in the end, the goal is to eat healthy and fresh foods more than anything. Um, so fruits and vegetables, they have our macronutrients. So all that fiber that's good for our guts keeps us from not getting constipated. And that prebiotic, all the fiber also has prebiotics that we hear about on TV now. Prebiotics are essentially fiber. Um, and so, you know, when you eat your fruits and vegetables, it already has that in it. It also has the micronutrients that we take in a multivitamin. You know, our fruits and vegetables have our magnesium, our zinc, all the other vitamins we need would come from all of this. And so, and eating whole grains such as brown rice or quinoa uh, instead of processed pastas. Uh, eating more beans, legumes, winter squashes, sweet potatoes. We have all of that here in South Central Pennsylvania. There's abundance of all of that. So there should be, you know, no reason to not eat any of that. Um, and so probiotics are also great. So what comes with prebiotics is probiotics. Probiotics are naturally occurring in sauerkraut, yogurt. So all of those, um, Foods that have probiotics are good for you. Probiotics put healthy gut bacteria back into our guts, keeping our gut healthy. And when we keep our gut healthy, our brains are healthy, right? Because all of that stuff, what we put in our body is what runs our body. If we put healthy fuel in there, we'll get healthy fuel to our brains. Oh, and I forgot. Um, the last one, very important, white sugar. As much as you can, try to minimize it. It can cause lots of inflammation and then lead to chronic diseases. So a little bit more on omega-3 fatty acids. Where, why are they important? They are also anti-inflammatory. They're protective for us. Um, and where do we find them naturally? in fish, salmon, sardines, herrings, black cod, omega-3 fortified eggs. Um, most eggs have that already in them. Hemp, if you're into putting seeds on your salads, hemp seeds, flax seeds, walnuts, and almonds have the highest amounts, as well as chia seeds, which I don't have up there, and avocado is um, super fruit, if you will, that is very high in omega-3 fatty acids. Also, you can think about fish oil supplements or flaxseed oil, not something. Uh, you can just try to get it from your diet itself and or supplement if you want. You should always talk to your doctor before you start any supplement. Uh, so that's the key to any supplement. Speak for your physician first. A little bit about the Mediterranean diet. Um, so it was also something, and it has been, it continues to be studied over and over again. It seems to have a very high component of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties. And at this point, does anybody know why a Mediterranean diet would have, uh, you know, why is it high in antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties? A Mediterranean diet is essentially high in fruits and vegetables. And so, and lots of fish, they eat lots of fish in that as well. It contains lots of olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, which has polyphenols, great for our bodies, great for our defense mechanism. And it actually has been shown to increase longevity. There have been studies that have been done uh, in a certain, areas and they show that it does increase longevity and you know the whole thing is though we don't want simple we don't want longevity without 
our thinking skills. So, you know, we want to keep our thinking skills as well. So here's some healthy oils, olive oil, as we talked about, coconut oil is also good, avocado oil, you know, if you're looking for a tasteless oil, instead of reaching for canola oil, reach for the avocado oils that they have in the markets. Sunflower seed oil is also good. They are all high in unsaturated fats. And so they increase your good cholesterol, decrease your total cholesterol, decrease bad cholesterol, that LDL and triglycerides, uh, reduce your blood glucose, they reduce your blood pressure. By reducing our blood pressures, we reduce silent cerebral infarcts. So when you go to a doctor's office or if you've ever had an MRI or a CAT scan and they say, oh yeah, they're age-related microvascular changes. They're, you know, essentially small capillaries, that picture we saw earlier, all these capillaries that end anywhere in our brain, they have these little, little infarcts, meaning there's ischemia there. It's your, that neuron or that bundle of neuron is no longer getting that blood circulation. And essentially there's lots of that. And so if we see that, that means there were changes that are occurring already. You're not seeing in your daily lives, but the brain is changing. And so we want to stay healthy. We want to keep our hearts healthy. You know, the arteries, they talk about having MIs. When we have infarcts in the brain, uh, they're silent cerebral infarcts, unless you see a big stroke. So that's why it's important. Blood sugar, you know, blood sugar leads to lots of other comorbidities. Uh, so it is very important to keep our, if we're diabetic, keep our blood sugars under control uh, by cutting out white sugar, cutting out carbohydrates, and eating healthier, more fruits and vegetables. Uh, so we're gonna kind of now move into how else we can optimize brain function. So physical exercise, I hear there's a large, a yoga program here, which is great. And so what is physical exercise good for us? Uh, essentially, it improves our gait and balance. So as we age, all of that changes, all those areas in the brain that we talked about, the muscle memory, um, you know, in the cerebellum back here, essentially, all of those areas need to be kept healthy and you have to continue to keep those connections going to keep our gait and balance and it helps us with performing our activities of daily living. You know, you wake up, you wanna be able to get out of bed, go to the bathroom, brush our teeth, change, get our own breakfast so we can continue to live alone, manage our own medications. Um, and so research is finding that staying active is one of the most potent ways of keeping your brain sharp and the mood bright. Because when we feel happy, we think clearer. When we're sad, we just, we don't, we're down and we don't feel good. So exercise releases endorphins. It's a feel good chemical, it naturally releases it and it helps us feel good, you know, so. And is it too late to improve functional impairment? Um, past the age of 60, blood circulation to the brain can decline, but it doesn't have to. So, you know, exercise can help this. It improves the blood flow to our brain and it provides more oxygen, more nutrients. So we want, we don't want those silent infarcts in any of those areas of the brain. Uh, but if we do have them, we want the brain, we wanna teach the brain to rewire and reconnect to keep it as active as we can. And so physical exercises, again, exercise is beneficial for people of all ages. Do anything you like, you know, whether it's simple walking 10 minutes a day in your house or outside of the house or coming to a senior center to enjoy activities with your friends here. That's wonderful. Uh, potential hazards, not too many, uh, excessively prolonged and intense activities but most of the programs are, and or if you're doing it at home, keep it within reason. Uh, so there's no routine pre-testing for truly asymptomatic patients. 
So a little bit from the American Geriatric Society, there is a program that they have designed in patients that have osteoarthritis. You know, even if you have arthritis, there is a form of exercise that you can do. You know, training and flexibility is essentially stretching. So a lot of times, you know, it starts with strength, endurance, and then stretching. Strength is muscle building, repetitions. You know, if you're using a one pound, two pound, or a water bottle. You can just use a water bottle or a can and repetitive uh, exercises help strengthen our muscles. Same with the legs, you know, seated exercises, not simply yoga, but you know, if they want to do movement exercises, repetitions help build the muscle. Strength provides us with the stability and improves our balance. Uh, endurance is aerobics part. So that's your walking, you know, whether it's walking or whatever, you wanna do at home, but a lot of patients prefer to walk. It's simple, you can do it anywhere. And flexibility is just stretching. So after you do strength training and endurance, your body needs a little bit of stretching. So maybe spend 10 minutes stretching every other day and, and or every day, you know, it feels good. So let's talk a little bit about cognitive activities, exercises, if you will. So there's four components that I wanted to talk about today. This is the third one. The first two were healthy eating. The second one was exercise is important for our brains. Third, very important thing is cognitive activity. Uh, what are cognitive activities and what do they do for us? Keeps your mind active, helps the brain form new connections. It rewires, helps stabilize or improves cognition. It may protect against dementia or memory loss. It keeps the brain healthy. It encourages new blood flow to the area. You know, how do we, uh, what are some of the things that we can do? Puzzles, you know, whether it's word searches, well loved by everybody, Sudoku, crafting, anything that will challenge our brains is good for us. Learning new skills at any age is great. It challenges the brain and it helps us reconnect. Uh, pick up a new hobby or recon rekindle with a new uh, old one. Uh, whatever it takes to keep the brain active instead of just sit and if you're watching TV, I tell everyone, you know, pick game shows so that activates your brain. You know, Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune, there's other shows during the day. Um, but anything that'll activate the brain instead of just watching simple TV. Reading also becomes passive uh, when we have memory loss because nobody is checking our comprehension. So you can read a book, but nobody's really checking to see if you understood what you read. So, you know, you can continue to read, but maybe spend 10, 15 minutes doing word searches or something else beforehand and maybe it w once in the evening or just whatever you wanna do every day, five, 10 minutes, um, but that is the key. And then increase it and add something else. Jigsaw puzzles are also good. There's lots of studies that we're seeing now. So there are lots of adult books, activity books out there that keeps our brain sharp. Social engagement, so that's the fourth thing. This is where we are at, at a senior center, right? Social engagement, social activity supports the brain and improves or delays cognitive impairment. How about that? Look at that. <laughs> just by coming here, just because you feel happy, you see others, uh, that's what it's supposed to do. Associated with living longer with fewer disabilities. Whether it's faith-based or friends-based, you know, a lot of the folks will say, well, they go to the church uh, twice a week, Wednesdays and Sundays, uh, or they volunteer at the church, or they volunteer somewhere. So those are some of the things you can do to socially engage yourselves. And so in summary, um, together with all four of those components, regular physical exercise, cognitive exercise, social engagement, and eating right, we can improve our brain health tremendously. Brain training, that's all that cognitive activity we talked about, physical exercise, all of that continues to train our brain and provides it with new skills every day. So don't stop, keep going. 
many ways you can keep your memory sharp. It may lessen or stabilize the symptoms. It's never too late. The sooner you start, the sooner you'll reap the benefits. And so, you know, it has a tremendous capacity for experience dependent neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is essentially our brain's ability to relearn or rewire and continue to keep learning and form new pathways within our brain to keep it active and going for as long as we can. I mean, yeah, eventually it may deteriorate, but the goal always is to keep everybody as healthy as we can for as long as we can. Everybody always wants to stay at home for as long as they can. And so that's the goal uh, with, you know, when we talk about all four of those things, including the sleep, that's the fifth thing as well stress management um, but I think if you exercise you will automatically start managing that stress improving your mood so exercise will help all of that so that's what I have today guys um, and any questions then that's the last of it